Great Foundation. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you here on behalf of the Great European Foundation, the European uh, Green Party and the Scottish Green Party, uh, with whom we've been uh, working with to facilitate this uh, space for international green capital. 503. That is perhaps the most shocking number I've heard since the beginning of this call. Um, do you know what this number represents? So you exactly, exactly. The number, according to the entry of global business, 503 is the number of fossil fuel lobbyists um, that are attending this COP as, as members of delegation. That's more than any national delegation here in Glasgow. Well, that is outrageous. Uh, but perhaps one of our best response as Greens um, is this hub and the activity that it has seen. Uh, since our hub opened, we've already seen more than 800 Greens and Green allies pass through those doors, representing more than 40 countries, with hundreds more joining our events online. And we are looking for many more in the next few days. Um, as the Green European Foundation, uh, we consider that our role is to facilitate public debate around green ideas to encourage cross-border cooperation and exchanges, bringing together diverse actors and bridging the gap between activism and the national level and international level. And the Green Hub is doing exactly that, providing a space for the intensification of interactions from the ecosystem of green actors, reaching both across and beyond Europe. The past few days as the, uh, at the Green Hub, I've seen a diverse variety of events, debates, seminars, workshops, trainings, and even traditional Scottish days. You've been there, I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the Green Hub has become a place for green actors to share, to network, to build capacities, um, and also to rest and recharge. We wanted the Green Hub to be a place for cutting edge debates, bridging together a variety of actors from different backgrounds. Um, including activists, politicians, foundations, academics, and we did exactly the emergency economy, which was very well attended. Um, we also wanted the Green Hub to provide a dedicated space for capacity building, particularly the Alpha Youth Hub, uh, facilitating learning skills, development, and ideas exchange between young people from all over the world. Already, the Youth Hub has hosted sessions on topics such as racial justice human rights, health, activism, and marginalized groups. And finally, we wanted this Green Hub to facilitate a space for networking amongst the Green family and beyond. We are delighted to have connected hundreds of Greens using this hub as a base between the climate negotiation, the local partners, and their home. Never before have we enjoyed the presence of so many Greens at COP, coming from so many countries. And we would also like to use this opportunity to take a step back uh, take stock of where we are as green movement and reflect. Reflect upon our successes and despite the hurdles that have uh, people that people have faced uh, because of the COVID crisis to get here, the urgent action that needs to be taken to tackle the current crisis uh, is here and now to, to take those actions. And the enormous progress that needs to be made during those climate negotiations um, as green movement. This is a very significant place for us to be, and um, as Greens, uh, including here in Scotland, uh, we are becoming a more and more important force, and we want this hub to be a testimony of that. So, um, I would just pass the throne out to the Greens, and... Uh, 
uh, in, the, in the and so uh, it's all, it was also important for us because we think that it's really today a moment during this cup. Remember the last result of the uh, IPCC is very good, no troubles. We have to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degree. Uh, and the consequences of uh, the climate change, it's not all, it's not any more, as some thought, in the islands, in the, in the far south, uh, or in the Arctic. The climate change has consequences here. I forget, I remember to life. We had the jobs in the in, in, uh, in Germany. And so the climate change is also here in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The objective uh, of the COP were, you know, decided in Paris years ago, already six years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, and today, COP26 is to say, what are we doing, each of us, each of the country? It's the unique window of opportunity for world leaders to act together to limit climate change. Today, each government has to say what they do concretely to end the objectives. How we end our reliance to the fossil fuels. How we decarbonize our economies and the societies. How we ensure a just transition where we leave no one behind. How we fight against inequalities and reinforce democracies. It's the first time also that we have seven countries where Greens are in government in Europe. We <laughs> hope to that we will have eight ministers that uh, And so uh, it's of course the European Green Party, but I don't forget. <laughs> I don't forget that here in Glasgow we have also Greens coming from all the world. Global Greens is also present. I know that some uh, Brazilians are here, uh, I know some Canadians who are here. We know that we have a minister also from New Zealand, and so in open, and he is playing a very active role for the moment in the, uh, the negotiation. It's the national. Uh, government, but we don't forget also the municipalities, the local councillors, or green mayors, uh, and they are here also uh, in Glasgow to prove that they move in their city. So we want to show that how we can move together, all the level, from the urban level to the national, urban level, and the local level, that we have to move together across our movement for green and fair future. So today, I stop because we have very prominent uh, speakers today and a very significant panel of these three, I can say, experimented and well-known figures of the three European parties. And maybe you can present the first one. Thank you. Um, so it's uh, my honor to present you the first uh, key speakers of the evening. He's a former Greenpeace France Company Director. Um, he's been a member of the European Parliament for the French Greens since 2009. He just won the, green, the French Green primary for the 2022 presidential election. And we could not hope for a better candidate to finally have a Green French president. Um, it's my pleasure to call to the podium Yannick Jadot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, I don't know uh, what was your feeling uh, when you uh, took your training, or maybe for those who are coming from very far in France, whether you uh, hesitated to come. It's COP26. And you know, in COP26, in COP uh, there is a figure. 26. And it's not, you know, kind of, you know, link to a regional uh, country or uh, to a place in the world. It's because it's a uh, 26 uh, con conference of parties. And uh, 
sometimes we all know that uh, those crops are becoming more and more kind of trade fair. And this is an issue for all of us because we know that in our countries, like industry in Glasgow, young people are somehow questioning our capacity to really act and to change uh, their future. And uh, of course, we can uh, recall to quote, uh, you know, this famous quote from Einstein uh, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those uh, who are watching them without doing anything. So, this is why we are here. We are here because it's totally unacceptable that hundreds of lobbyists are somehow taking over the COP and our uh, climate future. We are here because, of course, we are family, but we are not here because we are family. Otherwise, uh, we do a Zoom uh, session and it's, it's okay. We are here because we think that uh, climate is a, an international public good and that we need multilateralism. And of course, uh, the UN negotiations are not always as efficient, effective as we would like. But there is no alternative to multilateralism when it comes to fight for an international public good. So we need to be here. But we need to be here not only to be in the negotiation, and this is key, mission for many of us and uh, many more of course uh, in the conference center but we are here to tell a story about climate change about what greens can do for many years for those who are a bit old who knows i will not take about i will not speak about one of the because he is the oldest of all of us here uh, even in the spirit, which is uh, very difficult for him. But now that for those who have been uh, following this uh, conference of party for many years, we uh, do know that uh, there is such an attempt from developing countries, for example, you know, so that the negotiations are uh, moving forward to increase the budget, you know, now top it is for them, you know, to get the promises done. How now, these days, it is difficult to include loss and damages and uh, to take money into account. Uh, we were talking about Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg for the plots. Uh, I had the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to be Greece for the fires. And you know, it's villages which are disappearing. They are just disappearing because sometimes, not only because they burn, but because uh, the last few young people who are living in the villages, living from agriculture, uh, living from oil, olive oil, because everything has burned, means they are leaving the village. And the village will disappear because nobody, no young people, will live in those villages. So, meaning that the loss of damages, it's also a question for us now. We have not yet succeeded in having the level of ambition, the level of policies to, uh, to bring, uh, to, to, to reduce uh, the, uh, the, uh, the emissions, that we are already late in the adaptation policies, even in our countries. It's could be an opportunity, of course, for our society to realize how much climate change is present now. When we started all this negotiation, you know, even for those who were in Copenhagen uh, in 2009, the big conference, the big failure, what we were talking about, science and future generation. We were talking only about science and future generation. Now it's a reality, even for us, and of course, worse reality, for example, with uh, the family in, uh, 
in Madagascar. So we know the reality. The European society and the world society globally has taken into account this climate change issue. The question is what do we tell about this uh, issue of climate change? What is our narrative now? We have all the solutions, and you know Greens are very good at solutions. We take everything into account. It's very complex. You know, when we talk about something, we go you know, to the end of the chain to see how it works. So we are very good at solutions. Technology are even speaking for us now. The economic rationale is with us. Look at what we can do now in uh, uh, buildings, what we can do now with renewables, we, what is already uh, happening in agriculture, in transport. So the economic rationale is even with us. So why are we not succeeding right now? Because part of the society is very anxious about the present, is very anxious about the future. And somehow our narrative is a bit hard to explain. Status quo is chaos. Status quo brings climate, environmental, social, democratic, economic disorder. What we are saying to an anxious population is that we need change to bring back stability. We need change to bring back solidarity. We need change to bring back, and so, with uh, an anxious population, which was told for decades that we need to change, but for more liberalism, for less social protection, for less democracy, for less solidarity. We are coming to say we need change for a better world. It's not easy. It's not easy to explain this in some simple words so that we bring people with us. And then now, I mean, if we look at what is happening, and I will come to, uh, to Europe because my, uh, I'm supposed to talk about Europe. Because of the uh, Friday for Future, because of the reality, because of this economic rationale, climate is at the heart of the uh, political agenda in Europe. Clearly, of course, the pandemic is everywhere. But if you remove the pandemic, I don't know if we can remove the pandemic, but I mean, the, the, the heart of the political agenda in Europe is climate change with the Green Deal. We fought to have an objective for 2030 minus 65% because science says so. We managed to have 53, minus 53. But it's still better than minus 40. It's still better than minus 30. And we know how tough it's going to be to have this full package, you know, the, the famous fit for 55, the full legislative package you know, to reach that objective in a fair way, in a fair way, not waiting 2029 20, to start acting to try to reach the objective by 2030. So it's renewables, it's building efficiency, it's uh, uh, CO2 in cars, it's eco design, it's many, many, many things. So the Greens in government, in parliament, of course, will work to get the best outcome of this. But we need to tell another story. A story about reindustrialization. A story about how we relocate economy, companies near the place where we live. We need, and it was said, we need to talk about social justice. We have a huge issue of purchasing power linked to the energy crisis right now. The only, you know, uh, 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 energy emblem is, you know, having uh, renovated buildings 
renovate houses, how we put public money in those, how we give back purchasing power, purchasing power to families, how we develop transport comfortable, how also we take the issue of e-cars. It's not an easy debate within the Greens, but how we take the issue of e-cars, you know, as also a symbol of re-industrialization, not leaving the companies going everywhere. About food, about everything. So at the end, at the end if we are able to, to explain how the green agenda on climate can change every day's life, especially the life of those who are the most vulnerable, those who are the social, uh, socially uh, impacted. If we are able to do that, but at the same time, we need to be the political force which will reconciliate the society with the future. Because dealing with climate, dealing with biodiversity, dealing with solidarity, is to offer a future which might be good for everybody. And in this situation, trying to protect ourselves in the future is already a positive agenda. The Greens agenda, it's also to somehow reconcile ourselves with globalization, not this free trade agreement globalization, not this social competition, not this mechanization of everything, but globalization as humanity dealing with climate, biodiversity, solidarity. And this is taking back control of our daily life where we live. And this is so reconcil uh, reconciling ourselves with local life. And so, when we are reconciling society with future, with humanity, with local, with local life, we are somehow reconciling the society together. And when we are reconciling the society together, we can speak about freedom. We can speak about protection. We can speak about emancipation. And this is what is a progressive society. So, I think what we have to do here, and of course back home, on the uh, European agenda, on national agenda, on local agenda, what we need to tell is a story of the green agenda. Having a, a, a project for everyone, having a project we reconcile ourselves together. You know, I don't know if you follow a little bit the debate, the political debate in France. Now it's only about migration, and it's only about you know uh, getting rid of Europe. We uh, none of the the normal right side now is discussing about you know, getting rid of uh, uh, the uh, primacy of uh, the uh, Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice. It's becoming crazy. You know, if you ask the two score of the two extreme right candidates in front is 33 percent. This is a type of debate. And we need to be those who say that, you know, there is no, uh, there is no reason to be resignated to division, to hate. I mean, there is a project of hope, there is a project of fraternity, there is a project of harmony with nature, and there is a project which brings us together for a, a, a clean and a, a, a good future for us and for our kids. So, thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure that uh, in Europe and elsewhere, I mean, there is only one project. There is only one project for the society. There is extreme right, we know their project is totally consistent, it's totally a strong one, but there is only one alternative to that. It's not the socialist anymore. It's not the liberal anymore. It's not the conservative anymore. There is only one alternative to history mind. This is ecology. So, thank you very much.
hired to present her work, totally not here in Scotland, but uh, we have also Caroline, uh, Caroline Lucas, she was uh, an animal, so she knew very well uh, Europe, but uh, she was an MP before uh, being a uh, member of the parliament for the Green Party of England and the uh, She was also the chair and president of her party and uh, also member of the Green New Deal Alliance. So, Caroline Lucas. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's uh, very good to see all of you in here. Um, I was just going to start off with a few reflections about where we're at so far with the COP as we enter this second critical week. And I was just wondering what we've already heard just today about the pledges that have been made so far. You might have seen the carbon capture report that suggests that we are on course not to stay below 1.5 degrees, but instead to crash to 2.4. Degrees, which is a, a pretty hideous thought, really. And that is in spite of all of the agreements and the side things that have been done, you know, all these announcements that have been made and, and so forth. And I just think we have to call out the lack of accountability, the lack of transparency, the way in which all of these institutions come together to make big announcements, and yet we know that there is actually no legal underpinning for any of those. And the thing I think we really need to ask ourselves is when we're seeing those financial institutions, the banks, the companies, the countries, when they are talking about how much they're going to invest in the green economy, I think our question is how much are you still investing in the fossil fuel economy? Because it's no good just putting money into the good stuff if you're not taking money away from the bad stuff. And I think what we need to be doing is focusing on the bad stuff and pointing out that in spite of all of these very laudable goals that were discussed earlier in this week and last week, none of that stops the financial institutions continuing to invest in the fossil fuel economy. None of that stops the UK government, for example, going ahead with the oil field, the Campbell oil field off Shetland. It doesn't seem to stop them perhaps still going ahead with the Cumbrian coal mine or the expansion of aviation or the 27 billion road building plan. The list goes on. So the big thing we have to do is to focus on the bad stuff and in that respect I wanted to just give a shout out to all of the work that's gone on by people who are creating this uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty idea. Um, it's going to be launched formally, a parliamentarian call for it is going to be launched formally tomorrow morning. I think there are 150 parliamentarians from 30 countries who are going to be calling for this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And to me, it's just one of the most exciting things out there right now. Because unless we are keeping fossil fuels where they belong, in the ground, then all of the rest of this stuff really doesn't count for very much. You know, we know that the, the, the key issue is, is to keep fossil fuels in the ground. We know that fossil fuels aren't even mentioned in the Paris Agreement. Apparently, they're not even mentioned in the draft agreement that is circulating from this COP as well. It's like the words that they're not speak their name. Well, I think we need to speak their names loud and clear. I think we need to make very clear that it's not an accident that fossil fuels don't appear in the Paris Agreement or indeed the Glasgow Agreement. It is very convenient for those politicians who are up their necks in agreements with the fossil fuel companies that they are not actually the focus of our attention. So that is one thing I think we should do. Second, on equity, I just simply wanted to say the very obvious issue that. We know that the 100 billion still hasn't been um, forthcoming. We know that lots of damage still isn't being uh, front and centre of these negotiations as it should be. There was the wonderful, wonderful speech from Vanessa Nakate, the young climate activist from Uganda, who was talking about why adaptation funding isn't enough, that we need a separate fund for lots of damage. And she said just so powerfully, we cannot adapt to starvation, we cannot adapt to extinction. And that, I think, is a message that needs to go to the negotiators loud and clear. I think the voices of the global south need to be heard loud and clear, and the debate about reparations needs to be heard loud and clear. I and mean, all of those things are not happening 
and less greens and less the civil society movements themselves are putting those issues on the agenda. When it comes to Article 6, I wanted to say just a few words about, about offsets and about net zero. You know, I think we should all pledge to stop using the phrase net zero because that little word, those so three little letters, are incredibly dangerous. Net zero basically means that we will go on colonizing the lands of the countries of the South for a second time. I heard a figure given the other day that was suggesting that even if you just took one company, Shell, and if you looked at the amount of offsets they are planning to do just by 2030, that requires the equivalent land of three times the size of the Netherlands. You know, my friends, we know that this is just ludicrous, that there simply isn't enough land in the world to be able to account for all of the offsetting plans from these global companies and corporations and governments who, unless we hold them to account, have absolutely no plan at all to stop business as usual. There is a massive greenwashing going on at the top, as you know, but we just need to do everything in our powers to expose that. And the last thing I wanted to say, just before I get on to the Green New Deal, the positive part of what I want to talk about is that there is an elephant in the room as well when it comes to net zero by 2050 and indeed so many of the other pledges we're hearing. Net zero by 2050, let's just ponder that one for a moment. I've, I've already said why I think that word net should be banished. But net zero by 2050, that is 30 years away. You know, Greta Thunberg says with legitimacy that our house is on fire now. And when your house is on fire, you don't ask the fire brigade to come in 30 years' time. You need the fire brigade now, because the emergency is now. And there's another problem with 2050. There are many problems with 2050. But another problem, and this is where the elephant in the room resides, is that if you look at our current plans for economic growth, the size of the global economy is due to treble in the next 30 years. It is going to be hard enough to decarbonize an economy the size of our current one. The idea that we're going to be able to do that three times over is a fantasy. So Greens need to say loudly and clearly that on a planet of finite resources, you cannot have infinite growth. It just doesn't fit. But if it doesn't fit, then that means that the focus on redistribution has to be even greater. If we're not going to be able to grow ourselves out of our problems, we certainly need to redistribute massively in a way that's never been done before. And that brings me to the Green New Deal, because for me, the attraction and the, and the, and the wisdom behind the Green New Deal is the way in which it takes the social and the environmental together. It recognizes that there is no environmental justice without social justice. And I just wanted to say a few words because the trouble is that the, uh, the, the government and the corporations are very clever at co-opting our language. I mean, I, I nearly fell off my chair the first time I heard Boris Johnson talking about build back better. But of course what he meant was actually get out bricks and roads and, and that was his idea of building back better. But we need to be really careful about language, and already the language of the Green New Deal is being co-opted. And so I wanted to quickly say what I think the Green New Deal is and what it isn't. And the first thing that it isn't is a green industrial revolution. You know, a green industrial revolution has those connotations of colonialism and the exploitation of people and resources. I think the Green New Deal must end our life-destroying fixation on economic growth and extractivism. It has to go far beyond some kind of green Keynesianism. It needs to be an utter transformation of our economies and our societies and that we will settle for nothing less. I think as well it means that to deliver a green new deal where people and the ecosystem can flourish, we need to ask some big questions about ownership and we need to redistribute ownership and we need to rethink work and that we can't move beyond growth and extractivism unless we do. So that is why green parties around the world talk about redistributing ownership through cooperatives, through mutuals, through community benefit of companies. We need a diverse ecosystem of ownership where many more of us have a stake in the long term. We need to move beyond that growth-based economy and that means valuing the work that human hands do. Growing, producing, and delivering the food we eat, shaping physical infrastructure from low carbon transport to all homes, 
And crucially, also recognising that the care sector is part of our Green New Deal. That care sector, which has been so undervalued, but has perhaps just been noticed again through the COVID pandemic as people realise just what amazing work people do who work in that care sector. That is a low carbon part of our economy, and that is part of our Green New Deal as well. We need to invest in universal basic services so that everyone's basic needs are met for housing, education and care wherever in the world they live. We need a jobs guarantee so that everyone is able to access meaningful, well-paid work. And we need a shorter working week so that we all have time to contribute to our communities and actually just to remember what life's about, which is kind of about having, hopefully, some happiness and well-being with our friends and families and doing the things we want to do. And finally, any Green New Deal worthy of the name must be international in outlook, and that's why we need a global Green New Deal. Transformation in countries in the global north cannot be built on the extraction of resources and the exploitation of people out elsewhere. And that means transforming our lives, not just our energy sources. A real Green New Deal recognises the UK's colonial and climate debt to the global south, for example, and it means a serious transfer of finance and technology where they're needed. It means cancelling debt, and it means, again, foregrounding the voices of indigenous peoples and the global south. And it means collaboration on an unprecedented scale, and that's why I am so excited that we have recently launched a global alliance for a Green New Deal. And many of the members of that are, are here, and I wanted to um, flag on with Elizabeth May, who uh, is the former leader from the Canadian Greens, and she is part of this. Frank Beneva, who some of you might have heard yesterday from Rwanda, uh, he is part of this too. In fact, many, many uh, from the Green uh, parties are part of this global alliance. And I want to just end by talking about the three things that we hope that this global alliance for a Green New Deal will do. First, it's about sharing legislative approaches to Green New Deals from around the world. So we can learn, for example, from the Costa Rican ambitious decarbonisation plan. I'm very proud of Congresswoman Paula Vega. Has, has done so much to uh, bring about uh, a decarbonisation plan there, and we'll learn from that. Second, we'll be coming together at key moments to urge world leaders to be far more ambitious, and we'll have a, a laser focus on action. And finally, we'll be challenging institutions that currently block further and faster change, like the World Trade Organization, the IMF, and the World Bank. In conclusion, there is a whole world to win out there, and I think one of the most exciting things about our movement is that as well as having a rigorous critique of what's wrong with the world right now, we also paint compelling pictures of how the world could be. We know that beautiful and better world is possible. We know that it's already on its way. We know that it's about thriving individuals and a thriving nation around us. We know it's there for our winning, and together we know that we will win it. such a, a clear picture of the challenges um, to build a, a, a green, desirable, post-growth society. Um, I would like now to call our, our, our first, uh, last, last but not least, speaker of the evening. He uh, is a historical figure of the Scottish Green Party, a current member of the Scottish uh, Parliament, um, and uh, he's also the, the party spokesperson on climate, uh, Mark Russell. Thank you very much, Ben Lawrence. It's lovely to join you all uh, here tonight, and particularly to be on the panel with some of my European political heroes that are here tonight as well. Um, as Scottish Greens, we've always drawn inspiration from our European Green parties. And I can remember being in Paris at the Congress of the European Green Party in 1999. I think Caroline was there as well. And it's the first time that we, we've actually seen Greens in government. We've actually seen the, the, the amazing progress that Greens were making. Uh, and of course now in, in Scotland we've got the opportunity, a fantastic opportunity, um, to be in the Scottish government. We've got two ministers now here and we're looking at how we can really make progress and really emulate some successes that our European Greens have had over many years. Um, we're having really great conversations in this Green Hub and, and you know, big thanks to the European Green Party and the Green European Foundation for working with us in the Scottish Greens to make this happen. It's been fantastic. Last year has been incredible. Over 
the last week. And there's been some amazing yeah. <laughs> we have some great, well-rounded, intersectional discussions as well about the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, the social crisis that we have as well in society. And I think as European Greens, uh, this is an opportunity for us to face up to our legacy as well, to face up to our moral responsibility. So as industrialised countries, we have caused this crisis. And we cause this crisis as well through our shameful, shared European history of colonialization, colonialism. And you don't have to go far from this conference venue to see that legacy on the streets of Glasgow. We have streets that are named after our colonial legacy. We have a Jamaica street after former British colonies. I'm sure this is the case across European cities as well. So we need to face up to this legacy. And as Greta said, the, the climate crisis is a crisis based on an idea that some people are worth more than others and therefore have the right to steal and to exploit. So the voices of those who are marginalised and oppressed need to be not just heard at COP26, they need to be part of the design of the solutions for the new, new economics that we need in this world. Now, I was in the, the blue zone uh, last week and I think it's fair to say that there are some spaces where I'm hearing young people, where I'm hearing voices of indigenous leaders and people from the global south. And Alok Sharma, the UK COP president, you know, he, he sits there and he has a very good face where he kind of looks very intent, and like he's listening to everything that's happening. And he's taking it in and he's nodding. And he's trying to give confidence to people that their voices are being heard. But I seriously doubt whether those voices are really being heard, where it matters in the negotiations, where the solutions are actually being designed, where countries are coming together. And, you know, Caroline mentioned Article 6 and some of the fiendishly complex issues around carbon markets at the moment. We need to have the voices of indigenous people in there, in those discussions, to make sure that we don't end up with a new form of commodification of nature and a new form of colonialism coming out of the carbon market. When I heard indigenous leaders speak last week in the blue zone, they said, look, you know, we're not victims, you know, we're the custodians of the land. Our lands cover 80% of the world's biodiversity. So it would be ridiculous to not include these voices and not include these people in the design of the solutions to climate change. But I think as, as Europeans as well, um, we've got some work to do to actually listen to our own citizens as we design solutions to climate change. Um, I, I've been fascinated by some of the work that global citizens' climate assemblies have been doing around the world. Um, we've got a Scottish climate uh, citizens' assembly that's now reported the Scottish government. It's come up with fantastic ideas around how we tackle fuel poverty, make sure that people and live in warm, comfortable homes, and they're not having to show them. We roll back on domestic flights and we put limits on domestic flights where they're undermining rail services. That's a major shift in policy. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the president, uh, yeah, pre pre the president candidate that's here today, uh, Yannick Yago, will, will perhaps go further, and the Greens can go further in taking forward these pledges. But it, but it shows the importance shows the importance of listening to our citizens and co-designing these solutions with our citizens as well. And perhaps the biggest area where we need to work and listen and co-design is in the need for a just transition away from fossil fuels that involves our workers and our unions and our communities that are dependent on these jobs and the industries themselves. Um, but Caroline talked earlier about the, the, the co-option, how the oil and gas and fossil fuel industries are effectively co-opting our land. Well, that is absolutely the case, not just with the Green New Deal, but with the just transition as well. Because we have here in Scotland oil and gas companies that are saying that they're doing just transition, but actually what they're doing is they're promoting the status quo with some technological fixes bolted on the side. Carbon capture and storage, 
Blue hydrogen is, yeah, we should stop talking blue hydrogen, we should just call it what it is, it's dirty hydrogen. These are companies that want to continue with business as usual. They're not interested in change, they're not interested in just transition. But they've captured that word, that term just transition, and they've defined it to be about their business strategies for continued growth and continued exploitation of our environment. So we need to have a transition that actually goes somewhere, that actually has a destination, and that destination must also be just as well. It needs to create fair work, it needs to create good jobs for the future, and it needs to be a destination that follows the science. The reality is that this COP so far has all been about cutting back on coal. There's been no discussion about oil and gas, and yet weeks before, we have the UN uh, report on, on global energy production showing quite clearly that we're currently using double the amount of fossil fuels that we can afford to burn if we're to stay within that Paris, Paris Agreement target, keeping the world within our food by degrees of global heating. Now, the reality is that the fossil fuel companies are wanting to go in the opposite direction. The UK government currently allowing 6 billion barrels of oil and gas to be extracted from the North Sea. We're lucky if we can burn 4 billion barrels and still stay within the Paris Agreement. But the industry, of course, wants to go further. Their just transition is to take us up to 20 billion barrels of extraction, which would be an absolute climate disaster in no way, shape, or form. A just transition. <laughs> but, you know, the shocking thing about letting down those workers who work with the oil and gas industry as well. Because if we actually delay this just transition, we end up in a scenario where instead we'll see a deferred collapse of the industry. And the carbon price is high, where it's no longer economically viable to extract oil and gas, the market will fall out and people will be left on the scrap. And you know, we've had the experience of that already in the UK in the 1980s. Government policy effectively wiped out the coal industry within a short period of two years. Whole communities were jobless. And we're still feeling the effects of that a few generations on. There are families often in whole communities going to their second generation of jobless and less employment. So that's a, that's a legacy that we can't repeat when we absolutely need to have a just transition. But if it starts, friends, by, by drawing the line. And I want to finish just by um, urging you to support the initiatives here that are being developed by countries like Denmark and Costa Rica to draw a line on the new oil and gas development. Caroline talked about Canada. Um, there are countries here that want to draw a line under all future exploration. So Denmark and Costa Rica are launching the Beyond uh, Oil and Gas Alliance, I think, tomorrow. Uh, at COP26. And I think they're showing real leadership. They're inviting countries, states, they're inviting uh, regions as well to sign up to their agenda. They're saying that enough is enough. And this doesn't mean that we're going to be turning the taps off of oil and gas overnight, but it does mean that we're going to draw a line on future extraction and exploration, uh, exploration and work towards that just transition. So, our, our friends, I would urge you to. Um, to, to get behind the Beyond World Gas Alliance, I think it's something that all European Green Parties should support. Support that just transition. Listen to your citizens and make it a just one with fair, clean jobs at the end. Thank you very much.
the map you can see here, maybe. Yannick is coming back in a few minutes. Just a slide, there are some uh, news and information from Salon and from Macron, and we have to answer to some questions. So, we can begin maybe. It's question, intervention. Yes? You can begin, yeah. Hello, I'm John Kerr from Canada. Uh, Mark, I'd like to uh, ask you uh, to expand a little more on the experience of COVID here. For two years, as you said, left communities totally out of the order for, for many generations. It's my feeling that we're going to see a disruption of the ground death that's much more rapid. And people are talking about. I think we're seeing the deployment of renewables around the world and increasingly disruption of all those areas in every industry more rapidly and more aggressively than what the existing industry ever believed, all every single time in 150 years. So it feels to me that all this nonsense about a just transition implies some sort of orderly process where two or three people want to move from one industry to another. It feels to me quite likely that the bottom of the commodity oil and gas market is very likely, and we're going to have many hundreds of thousands of people unemployed worldwide in what seems like a case of So, could you just bring that back to the cold thing? I think this is just about the thing about doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, I, I, I think the key thing is to not repeat those mistakes of the past. There were different sets of conditions. Uh, in the UK in the 1980s, which was more about government policy and, and, and actually a war with the unions as well at, at that time. Um, what I'm saying is that you know, we can manage the transition much more effectively, but it does need a full commitment from governments to say right now that they're going to plan for the end of gas. Now, like in the UK and in, in Scotland, absolutely, do we need oil and gas? Yes, we do today. But with our climate plan and with the commitments that we've been making, we know that we can reduce that dependence on oil and gas over time. So there's a bit of maths to be done here. We've got to work out, A, what can we afford to, to use under the Paris Agreement? What keeps us Paris compliant in terms of our extraction of oil and gas in the UK? Secondly, how quickly can we decarbonize? And you're right, it could be that we can decarbonize some sectors exponentially quicker than others. And also, you know, thirdly, then what, what we have left, you know, what, what is our actual demand going to be for all this gas between now and 2035? I'm sure there will be some residual demand across the UK for all this gas, and we can plan for that, right? We can plan for that, there will be some residual jobs. But the rest of it really needs to be planned for a transition out, and that could be a transition to renewable energy, but also a whole range of other economic uh, that's something we've been working on. Government of Scotland has uh, targeted double onshore wind production in Scotland, um, but the targets for offshore as well. But we need industrial strategies to back that up to make sure that all jobs are there. I just wanted to add as well that um, I was the chair of, a, of an interesting commission set up by IPPR, that's the Institute for Public Policy Research uh, in the UK, and it was an environmental justice commission. And what we were looking about at was how you get fairness fully embedded in this transition. And we had really prolonged um, citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries, in four places around the UK, Aberdeen in uh, Scotland, Durham in Essex, uh, the Welsh Valleys, places that were going to be on the front line of change. And it just felt so important that it is those communities, not just the working people, but all of the surrounding communities, that have the best ideas about what kind of extra skills they need, what kind of training they need, and so forth, what their communities need in order to make that transition work. And so it feels to me that as well as making all of the obvious points about the finance needs to be there, the retraining needs to be there, income guarantees need to be there, but crucially I think the workers' voices and the, and the voices of the communities need to be there because they know less what their communities need. And I think if we can start those now, because I agree with you, I think that it could all happen an awful lot faster uh, than, than Phrase just transition implies, and we need to be having those conversations right now.
Thank you very much. My name is Martin Ovindo from Kenya. I represent the Greek Focus Party of Kenya. Uh, uh, I thank you. Thank you. 
We have time for one more quick question. Um, maybe the woman from the back could be answered. Hey, Alexandra, Archaeology from France. Um, I would like to actually um, ask you, Jenny, Jenny Kello, about your reaction uh, regarding President Macron's announcement about the relaunch of the nuclear plan. What is next from the EU politics in France and in Europe in general with such announcement? Thank you. You know, President Macron uh, is the one, as economic minister, uh, managed to uh, convince uh, Maxime Dernay at that time not to renounce on the e point project. Uh, because, you know, there was this uh, polemic about you know, the Chinese within the project, and there was this polemic in France, because even he yet didn't want at that time the E3.1 project anymore because all the way up for EDF now. I mean, the, 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 the British consumers will pay twice the price of renewables. I don't know how long they will stand for that, you know. It's a crazy situation. So, but you know, for that, President Macron is using the, uh, the fact, which is not false, that you know, nuclear is not the most policy. The, the most CO2 emitting energy. That's clear, it's factual. But to protect and to relaunch nuclear, Macron has to make an alliance with Poland, with the eastern countries of Europe, especially those who are totally linked to the gas lobby to save nuclear in France. So is promoting nuclear as uh, low CO2 emitting energy, but to protect it, he has to make alliance with the most polluting energy. So this is what we have to denounce, that, you know, uh, Macron is not here or in Glasgow or in Paris to save climate. He wants to save nuclear, and to do so, he blocked or he uh, uh, reduced the level of ambition of Europe on renewables, on energy efficiency and savings, on climate targets. And he is the one now on taxonomy in Europe, fighting hard to make sure that, to try to get that nuclear project could be seen as green project and be financed in a better condition. And this is the reality of nuclear. It's a dirty energy, always relying with all the other dirty energies just to save uh, itself. I want to thank our speakers today tonight. I know it's a bit frustrating for those who want to to speak more, but we have to finish at 8 o'clock, but we 
want to invite you also for a drink and there is something uh, to eat also. I know that it's not on the same level, but I think that to drink is there. What I am to ask you. So, the plan is uh, you can all stay with us and continue our discussions in a more social setting, but um, we have We'll have you go to the cafe where you can take food, and you take food with you, and you go upstairs and you get the drinks upstairs. So you go to a room upstairs, um, and, and we can continue having the, the discussions all together. So thank you.